All right, so let's do just a little bit of a recap. Uh, last week, we were kind of uh, surveying the worship landscape, right? We were talking about um, a history of the worship wars and uh, where that left us. Um, so remember we talked about like the idea of traditional versus contemporary. It's not really a thing. Uh, one church is traditional, it's another church is contemporary. Also, the, the goal posts are constantly moving, right? Uh, Bach was a radical contemporary, <laughs> right? Like, when he came out, like, he was, like, shaking things up. They're like, that's way too many notes. <laughs> Go easy on the notes there, Bach. That's too many. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's constantly evolving. It's nothing to be surprised about. Um, it's just the way it's our nature. Uh, music trends move faster than we can. Um, you know, I I even think about, like, the technology behind music trends is fascinating. Um, we had, uh, how many of you were at D-Now? Did any of you all help with D-Now this year? Or have kids at D-Now? Yeah, we had um, a great band, same band that we had two years ago. Um, and they're... Um, made up of musicians from Sojourn Network. And so if you're familiar at all with Sojourn Network in Louisville, they've been known for their music for since their founding. They're, they've always been kind of on like the edgier side of, um, I don't know, just like a lot of, like especially Sojourn Midtown's known for like really loud guitars. And so that's where this band came from. And they're super great folks, very pastoral. And uh, it's even just like chatting with them about the technology. They couldn't believe that I don't, lead worship with like in-ears which are like the headphones that you know they're all like they've got the little headphones in and it's feeding them the click track and there's someone in their ear going chorus in one two three and you know that's just like part of their thing and they like how are how are you even doing that like how do you know <laughs> and it's just I just grew up without that technology being available and so it doesn't even apply to the way that I think about leading worship so the point is there's no right or wrong there. It's just that it's constantly moving. And, you know, in 20 years, those guys will feel two steps behind whatever the next thing is. And that's just the way it keeps going. And that's, part of that is okay. That's just the natural development of technology. And, you know, we all become like set in our ways. I, I get really grumpy when people try to hand me in-ears on a stage. I'm like, no, I just need a wedge. You know, <laughs> it's just my nature. Uh, and so it's constantly moving. Uh, but so the technology trends, the music trends, they're always going to keep moving. If our goal is ever to be on that cutting edge, we've already lost the battle, right? Unless we are actually the ones innovating and setting it forth, but which we're not going to be. And that's, that's perfectly acceptable I, because that's not our goal as a church, right? Our goal as a local body of believers is not to be setting the cutting edge of worship technology, worship music. Um, so trying to keep up with constantly moving targets, like I said, it's a losing battle. So, um, that's just kind of a quick recap. Any questions about worship wars before we look at where we, where we go from here? All right. So we are now, we are post-war worshipers. Um, I kind of came to this conclusion about midway through my time at, at Boyce College in Louisville, where I realized, uh, you know, I just had the, the opportunity, I'm super thankful for, to serve in a few different churches that were all very, stylistically very, very different. And yet all of them uh, had come to their conclusions because they had come through some sort of difficult battle in the worship wars, right? So, like, my first church that I served in as an intern uh, was Clifton Baptist in Louisville, which is very, um, compared, compared to most churches, it would be considered traditional. Like it's, your, your music is printed out in the hymnal, like the sheet music is in the, or not in the hymnal, in the, uh, in the bulletin. So the lead sheets for every song you sing are in the bulletin uh, because you have a lot of folks in the congregation who read music and who want to see the parts and want to, you know, they want the SATB all the way through. 
Um, and that was, they landed there after there was a church split and then there was a merging and there's all kinds of stuff. There was new leadership that came in. Uh, and it's extremely healthy church, beautiful church. And then I went to another church where my job was as the contemporary worship pastor, right? So it was a church that didn't split, but through, you know, years before I got there, through some very difficult conversations had landed on, well, let's do, let's do a traditional service and a contemporary service. And then that wasn't enough. Then, the, then it became, let's do a traditional a, a service at 8.15, a contemporary service at 9.30, and a blended service at 11. I'm not even joking. That's real. <laughs> and the differences between that were uh, less than the congregation realized, right? Like there was a lot more in common between all those three services than they, than they were aware. Um, a lot of times, all three would do the same songs. We just wouldn't tell the other people. <laughs> <laughs> but what you end up having then, uh, and it's, it's hard to pastor that kind of a congregation because I would, you know, someone would come to me with some situation and be like, you know who could really help you walk through this? So and so. Like, go talk to them. I'm like, who's that? I'm like, you know, like, I'm like, oh, they come to the 11. I'm, I'm, I'm at 930. So you have, you end up with three different churches, essentially. Like, three entirely different congregations because we're no longer gathered together. Um, so a lot of decisions were made. A lot of uh, churches are kind of just planted in where they came out of this time period. So that's why it's important for us not to linger on it, not to like point and make fun, but just to say like, okay, that happened. Now we didn't know where the Christian landscape is. Uh, so we got to reckon with the damage done. There's lingering hurt. Um, it's amazing how many like, sm I learned just as a young pastor, how many small decisions will bring up uh, just lingering hurt that was never apologized for, never, you know, something was handled wrong. And all of it coming back to uh, musical decisions. Uh, because remember, what, what did we say that music does do effectively? It stirs up emotions, right? So when you have emotions invested in a particular kind of music, and then that's taken from you, that's, that feels like a, a kind of a hard loss. So today, uh, we have to reset our priorities. So we are building a post-war theology of worship. How do we do that? So this is going to be kind of the higher elevation look at what that means. And then we'll get into in the, see, this is week three, right? Yeah. So we have two more weeks. So in the following two weeks, we'll get into the specifics of how this uh, practically pans out at Buck Run, why we make the decisions we do things like that. But from a higher altitude, here's the five fundamentals of building a post-war theology of worship. Number one is content and adoration. Uh, we'll hit, here, sorry, <laughs> keynote. Content and adoration, we'll hit all the points and then we'll break them down one by one. Number two is quality, excellence, and creativity. Number three is unity, preference, and deference. Number four is intentionality, shepherding, and discipleship. And number five, cultivation, training, and equipping. So let's begin, let's dive into content. Uh, this is number one for a reason. It matters what we sing. Um, the songs that we sing are selected for congregational worship. They are carefully inspected for their content. Again, this is not... Some of us, I think, may take that for granted at a church like Buck Run. That's not the case everywhere. It certainly wasn't always the case even at Buck Run. Um, this was... Uh, music had less of an impact on the... On the on the daily, on the day-to-day -day planning of pastoral staff for a long time. Um, and part of that is because f generally most of it was just safe. Uh, but now there's a lot less safe congregational options out there. So we have to spend a little extra time and be really careful in 
uh, what we're singing. They must be theologically correct. Obviously, we don't want to sing a song that is theologically errant, right? Uh, what we believe and preach about God is central to what we do here. Uh, so we don't want to present something through song that goes against that. Because remember, we, one of the things we talked about in week one is that we believe that songs teach, right? Like songs instruct, they teach. Um, Dr. York even talked about how um, songs are really good at helping us remember key theological concepts because, you know, the hooks get stuck in your head, the lines get stuck in your head. Uh, and so if we're going to have our folks singing throughout the week, repeating things in their minds that they've heard and sung at Buck Run, it's got to be theologically correct. Um, we don't want you to be lingering on something that's errant. Uh, they must correctly apply scripture. These two obviously go hand in hand. Uh, but there are songs that like will quote scripture, but kind of miss the point, right? Uh, that <laughs> it, ha- it happens. It happens a lot. Um, uh, trying to think of like a good example. I don't mind telling you that I don't, I'd normally try not to like throw names out there of who I think you should stay away from, but I don't mind this one because it's so public. But like Israel Houghton is a great example of like really just not understanding the Bible <laughs> and singing it and applying it in all the wrong ways. Um, just taking verses completely out of context and then making like a different anthem out of them. So we avoid that. We want our songs, because remember, what's the central element of our worship service? The preaching of the word, right. Everything that we do hinges on the word of God. So it has to correctly, just like we would expect Herschel to correctly exposit the word of God, our songs have to correctly apply the word of God. Uh, They must encourage obedience, not sin. How can a worship song encourage sin? Yeah, like being self-focused, things that like I can do, Uh, How else? Anything else? It seems kind of extreme because you're like, secular music leads us to sin, not worship songs, you know. But there are ways. It happens. It's and it's subtle, and I don't think it's necessarily nefarious. But yeah, I think a lot of it, most of it, does center around like self, right? Like uh, there's just a lot of like self motivational type of, (laughs) you know, the things that I can do that I can accomplish. rather than like what God enables in us, what God says about us. Uh, They must lead our hearts to respond in adoration and submission. And this kind of butts up against that self thing too, because uh, submission is a big part of it. And it's not easy for us to submit to the will of God. Um, That's not something that is popular. It's not something the secular world encourages, uh, but we need to con- we need to communicate through submission through our songs that obedience is central to our walk with Christ. Uh, we want obedience to be reflected in our songs. Um, that's why, uh, and we'll talk about this more, I think next week. Uh, we don't follow like a rigid uh, liturgical pattern that you would see at like a more of like a high church type of scenario. Um, But we do, even though it's not communicated like in a bulletin, there are liturgical elements that we're trying to hit every Sunday in a particular order. And one of them is confession, right? We want in our singing to confess together corporately. Uh, We want to confess that like, yeah, we did mess up this week. Excuse me. Um, And we submit to God's holiness, we submit to the idea that, like, I didn't just sin against myself or my family. I sinned against a holy God. That's a big deal. So what do we do when we sin against a holy God? Well, we really only have two options. We either continue in disobedience and store up wrath for ourselves, or we submit in faith and trust of Christ as our Savior, and we apply his righteousness to our account uh, 
So then we, after we sing a song of confession, we, we like to sing a song of uh, the assurance of pardon in Christ, that what he did was enough. Uh, they must offer instruction on the truths and practices of following Christ. Uh, what's, a, what's a song you can think of that we sing that, that does this well, that offers instruction on the truths and practices of following Christ? I think of uh, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. You know, to this I hold. My hope is only Jesus. And it walks through the different scenarios that we face in life and that our trust, our only hope is in Christ. Can you think of any other examples? Before the throne? Yeah. Yeah, I tried to break that one down with our students recently when we, were, when we sing. We sing that in student worship a lot. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that when it comes to shepherding and discipleship, training and equipping, why, how, why it really matters what we sing. Uh, golly, I'm so bad at keynote. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, particularly with students, um, it's so important to get our young people on board with this stuff early um, and to help them see the beauty in, in what we're singing. But I, I did talk about Before the Throne of God Above, um, partly because Will was preaching on this idea of having a great high priest. And uh, so Will did a really good job of emphasizing the incredible significance of that. And then we got to come in after that and sing. Uh, and so, you know, I have conversations with students all the time who are like, I come to church and I just feel like a terrible person, you know, like I'm happy all week. And then I come to church and I feel terrible. I'm like, well, that's not because we're telling you you're terrible. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you, <laughs> you know, like, and, and we don't want you to feel that way. We want you to see that there is an answer for that feeling, that, that there is a remedy for that conviction and that you can approach the throne of God. You have a great high priest and, and, you know, sometimes it's because a student doesn't actually have a relationship with Christ and we get to disciple them through that. Sometimes it's because they're dealing with a sin issue in their life. Um, but yeah, like having those songs that walk us through uh, the importance of how we live as Christians. Uh, here's a great quote from Harold Best. I cannot insist enough on the strategic importance of a speech-rich church to a speech-degraded culture. The church is, after all, a rich cross-section of civilizations. Mothers, fathers, farmers, technicians, scientists, teachers, lawyers, and artisans. No one is excused from the responsibility to speak carefully, temperately, accurately, even poetically. For the authentic worshiper, nothing but God is awesome. I love that idea of a speech-rich church to a speech-degraded culture. Um, one of the beautiful things about a gathered body of believers who's doing this stuff well is that we're putting a lot more thought into the things that we say and do than uh, our secular workplaces or our secular marketplace. Um, and we don't do it for branding purposes. We don't do it for marketing purposes. We do it because um, this, you know, we want to communicate that God is central to what we're doing. Um, responding in worship, so we're going to look at ad looking at adoration specifically. Uh, responding in worship always begins with adoration and submission. We cannot worship that which we esteem lower than ourselves. Um, again, kind of back to what you're saying about the lifting up of the self. Um, one of the tenets of uh, satanic ideology, I almost said theology, but it's not, satanic ideology is uh, that self is central, and do what thou wilt is like their motto. Um, I don't think most of our secular places would recognize themselves as satanic, but those key tenets are central to what they teach and what they communicate to us that we are self-important, we are self-sufficient, and you do what thou wilt. Um, and so we constantly battle against that, that we submit to something higher than ourselves. We have to esteem God as so much more than us. Um, 
self-esteem, you know, that's a whole different topic of what that actually looks like for the believer. Uh, we definitely see worth in ourselves because God made us worthy. Like he, we are image bearers. Like we have intrinsic value. That's why we, you know, that's why we fight the pro-life battles because we believe in the value of individuals. Uh, but we always esteem God as higher than us. Um, and we cannot worship that which we esteem lower than ourselves. Uh, can someone pick up a couple of these verses for us? Someone want to grab Psalm 33? I'm sorry, Psalm 34, 3. And then Psalm 99, 3. I'll pick up uh, Psalm 145, 3. Huh, uh. <laughs> Uh, when you find it, just go ahead and start reading it. We're, we're singing that song in choir soon. The Shane and Shane, Psalm 34. Magnify the Lord with me. I love that song. Go ahead, Micah, sorry. Psalm 145, 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. David gets it. David is part of a culture that understands submission and they understand the bowing of self and he is proclaiming the greatness of God and that's what we have to do. We have to see God as so much higher than ourselves. Magnify the Lord with me. Um, it's central to what we do. It's a quote from Bob. The first priority of our time together is to magnify the Lord. I want to help people remember that God is bigger than their problems and joys greater than their sorrows and successes, more significant than their tests and triumphs. Uh, I like that Bob sees that on the both sides of that coin because we don't just battle against uh, people who are stuck in a deep sorrow. We battle against people who are extremely comfortable and successful and feel self-sufficient, right? Um, and I've seen you know, both far swings of that. Um, you see churches that are geared towards um, kind of wallowing in that, like, that uh, the need for deliverance from something. And then churches that uh, their worship has clearly been put together by people who feel totally comfortable with where everything is. And it's usually because of some kind of financial success you know, whatever it may be. Um, so we want to constantly show people, because we have a diverse body, that God is bigger than our problems. He's bigger than our joys. He's bigger than our sorrows. He's bigger than our successes. He is uh, higher than all of those things. Um, so part of adoration is proclaiming God's greatness. Uh, we're going to talk about proclaiming God's greatness and loving God's greatness. And some examples here of proclaiming God's greatness to give us song specifics. Holy, holy, holy. Doesn't get much better than that in proclaiming God's greatness. All creatures of our God and King. Uh, look and see, which we're singing this morning. All about proclaiming God's greatness. And then there's loving God's greatness. And we'll talk about the difference between these two. Good, good Father, great is thy faithfulness, yet not I, but through Christ in me. So what do I, what do I mean by the difference between proclaiming and loving? Both, all, both these care categories, proclaim and love, but there is a lyrical s switch between the two, where some are leaning more in the declaration, uh, almost like a, a herald on the castle wall, declaring that the king is coming declaring his greatness, and others switch more to uh, at the dinner table with a loved one, celebrating in, in community, right? There's a lyrical kind of turn where we're shifting away from heralding into that more intimate, this is what the Lord has done for me, this is how I uh, love him, this is why my heart sings of him, and you see this in David, right? The psalmist models this for us too, where it'll be uh, magnify the Lord with me, and, and then it'll switch to more of an intimate, like, let me tell you what God has done for me personally, what he has done for my people 
corporately, and there's like this more of like a love song to God, right? And both are perfect and awesome and central to uh, how we sing. Oh, goodness. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, just, just a quick recap. Uh, but yeah, the combination of proclaiming and loving leads to true adoration, that wedding of truth and passion, uh, mind and heart. Um, because either one, we can, we can err either way. Um, I've been in churches where it's like very intellectually driven, and it's very, uh, it's all about proclamation. And you kind of wonder like, yeah, those are all true things, but have you ever felt them? <laughs> you know? And the other side is true too, where it's uh, leaning a little too heavy in like the love song kind of feel. Um, and that can lead to songwriting where like if you just take Jesus out and put in babe, <laughs> then it's like, then it could be like a, a pop hit, you know? <laughs> like, uh, so we want to avoid that as well. Uh, because music does, again, stirs up our emotions. That's a positive thing as long as it is based on real truths, things that we really, really believe, and things that we have experienced, things that God has done for us. Um, responding in worship is made richer through instruction. Let's look at Colossians 3. Gosh, my mom would be so upset to know that it's faster for me. Bible drill state champion <laughs> to type it in than to search for it. Okay. That all, that, all that talent waste. <laughs> the trophies on your wall, son. Um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You hear how even that verse weds that idea of heart and mind? Um, let it dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing you in all wisdom. But then how do we sing? We sing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. Oh, that's good. It's good that our hearts are changed and made thankful, that our love songs are responding to wisdom and, and teaching and admonishing. Uh, so responding in worship is made richer through instruction. Our songs should teach the doctrines of our faith. This uh, has early roots in church history because, um, you know, before the Reformation, a lot of uh, a lot of times the the text was delivered in a language foreign to the majority of the people hearing the text, and so the actual. You know, if they were going to remember anything, it was going to be the words that they sang in English after that. Uh, thankfully, you know, Herschel's not up there preaching in Latin or Greek or anything. Um, our song should teach the behaviors of a Christ follower. This is something that surprisingly disqualifies a lot of songs. Um, one of our main sources for sheet music is uh, praisecharts.com, which I, this is my unpaid endorsement. Um, they do a great job of categorizing, making things available in lots of keys, that makes it more singable for folks. Great resource. Um, but, you know, they're a business, they sell music, and so I see, like, their top charts. And uh, there's a lot of songs that are popular where like the first verse is like, it's not sinful, but it's like, man, that's, that's not a behavior that I would want modeled by our people in the congregation. Even if it's, even if it's later redeemed in the rest of the song, like, you know, I felt this way, but the Lord did this. Like, uh, I don't know. I just don't think like, we don't have a whole lot of time with you guys. I don't want to spend a whole verse like lingering on something uh, that is not a behavior uh, of, of a Christ follower. So that, that rules out a lot of stuff. Um, before we get on, any, any other questions about um, content and instruction? 
That's a good question. I'm sure there is. I'm just trying to think of one. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> that one never has never panned out well. Even though, I don't know if you remember, this, like a month after that song came out, there was a Christian rewrite of it. Uh, because that was the 90s, folks. <laughs> that's, that's how we did things. <laughs> it did. It sure did. God bless us. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they do try to couch difficult doctrines in softer language. That does happen. Um, sometimes I like the language of brokenness because I want people to see how broken we are by our sin. Um, but sometimes it is used as like a softball. You're not supposed to ask that question yet, Don. <laughs> it's the, you know, they crack my knuckles. <clears throat> um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going there. Here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, don't remind me. Okay. Okay, let's just I told you to ask anything cuz we have an answer for all of the reason we do these things. All right, so we're going to talk about Christian publishing now. This is we're going off script. Don ripped the band-aid off. Stop the, ca- stop the camera. Stop the camera. Turn this off. This is sensitive. I don't want this on YouTube. Um okay. Does anyone have any basic idea of how Christian publishing works, Christian music publishing? There's this thing called CCLI. I should really know what that stands for, and I don't remember off the top of my head. Something Christian, something... (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Uh, Theoretically, what happens is, and this doesn't happen often... Churches keep records of the songs that they sing, and uh, we should all, every church should be a member of CCLI, because, I don't know if you know this, but music law in the United States is so messed up. It is, it is a disaster. Well, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> boom, <laughs> Jesus juked her. There it is. <laughs> right. So CCLI is a really good attempt at uh, making music law easier on churches. Um, If you have a worship song that you want it sung in churches, you get it licensed through CCLI, and churches then just pay an annual fee that's basically just a blanket thing. You know, we pay, I don't remember how much it is, we pay whatever it is, and then we can sing as many songs as we want that are licensed by CCLI. To put it in con- contrast that, like if you're singing, if you're like a, a well-known performer and you're going to cover someone's song, you got to pay a hefty fee to cover that song. And obviously, like, you know, Sovereign Grace isn't going to charge us like $5 every time we sing All I Have is Christ. Um, but like I was just listening to a podcast about the show The Office, and they played, uh, it was like a seven-second clip of... Uh, I can't remember the name of the song. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not on that kind of platform. Yeah, and they paid they paid forty five thousand dollars. Yeah, you know that's that's someone's salary, <laughs> like, or five seconds on national TV. So anyway, CCLI uh, at the end of the year, what Buck Run does, what most churches do, is we give them a report. Uh, because of our scheduling software, it's easy to pull a list of the songs that we've sung. CCLI takes that, they figure it out, and they say, okay, they sang All I Have is Christ 18 times. Uh, whatever percentage of money that uh, goes for that song, they'll, they then pay out to the artist. It's not nearly as much as uh, like a, a 
you know, Dua Lipa gets every time a song comes on. Who thought I was going to drop Dua Lipa today, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's it pays out a lot less, but it actually, if you have a song that's sung in tons of churches, you know, Matt Redman's doing fine from 10,000 Reasons. You know, like the old worship leader joke is I've got 10,000 copies of 10,000 Reasons. Like, he gets, he's getting paid for those copies every time it's sung. Like, it's, it's happening a lot. That's where it gets really complicated and like how he, it, that's usually like a lump sum payment. So like when he did, is he worthy? I don't think, An Andrew's not going to disclose that, but I'm pretty sure it was probably like a, here's a lump sum of money. I'm going to cover this without paying you every time I do kind of thing. I don't really know for sure. There's different, there's so many different ways you can work it out. We have some Christian music publishers out there that are extremely popular and make really, really, really great music, um, but come with a lot of baggage. And so there's this ongoing debate. If, if there is a worship war happening now, it's happening over this topic. And it's how do we handle problematic Christian publishers? We're going we're gonna to lay them out there, all right? Gloves off. Here we go. So the key ones are elevation, uh, Bethel, Hillsong. Those are the the three horsemen of Christian publishing. <laughs> Why? What would cause someone to avoid using songs by one of these things? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Sometimes the songs themselves don't meet the criteria we just laid out, right? So that would be a song by song basis, right? Why would we wholesale reject an entire Christian publisher? Usually it's because it's a reflection of the church that's funding it. So uh, Elevation, Bethel, Hillsong all have problematic churches at the helm. Um, this week, I'm going to be real honest with you, we're singing a Hillsong song this week, Okay. Also this week, uh, Discovery Plus dropped a Hillsong documentary that I haven't watched. I have no intention of watching it um, for a lot of reasons. Number one, I'm sure that the church that they are looking at, it's not Hillsong as a whole, but it's one particular New York campus. I, I am 100% convinced it is a disaster. It's a mess. I wouldn't send my dog there. But I also don't trust lost people to do a faithful documentary of a church. Um, I'm sure it's ugly. I'm sure it's a disaster. I'm sure it's sinful. I don't want to hear someone who doesn't believe in God smear a church. So I'm not going to watch it. Um, because I do believe there are believers here, right? And there's real people experiencing really terrible hurt. So I don't need... Discovery Plus to like rub their face in it. Um, I mostly think of students when I think of these things. I, all of you guys in this room, I trust, are mature enough in your faith that if we sang a song from Elevation, I don't expect you then to go listen to Stephen Furtick preach. Because if you like the way Stephen Furtick preaches, you wouldn't have come to Buck Run in the first place, right? Uh, it's a very different approach to preaching, very different theology. It's just, it's not what we do here. Where it concerns me the most is young people. Um, because, for one, they're, they're just more avid Googlers than we are. <laughs> so I don't want to sing an Elevation song at student worship and then have uh, a new young believer, eighth grade freshman, go home and Google Elevation worship and then find Stephen Furtick and then listen to Stephen Furtick's sermons and get all kinds of garbage in their minds. It'd be a disaster. Here's another fun fact about Elevation in Christian publishing. Um, I'm a songwriter, right? I love writing congregational worship music, other kinds of music. Whenever I write a song, I don't put Herschel as a co-writer, <laughs> right? Because Herschel doesn't, he's not in the room. Elevation doesn't matter who writes 
the song, you can look at every single song they put out, and Stephen Furtick will, uh, it'll be like S. Furtick, I don't even know how to spell his name, will be, uh, will be listed on there as a co-author. I think most of that is just based in ego. Um, but it's also related to Christian publishing. It's a, it's a money stream. Yeah. Like, he is just cashing in on elevation worship. So, we don't necessarily, we don't want to sing because we don't want our CCLI money to go to elevation. Now, again, it's kind of like, it's kind of like using paper straws over plastic straws. It's not making a difference. You know what I mean? Like, buck run boycotting elevation isn't going to ruin their bank account. Um, But... There is a principle behind it. We don't want to fund something like that. But my biggest thing for not using Elevation is I don't want to guide someone to their ministry. That's where it gets dicey. And I'm not going to break down all of the theological issues with Elevation and Bethel or Hillsong, but just trust me that they're there. It's a lot of prosperity gospel type things, stuff like that. Yeah, Micah. Yeah, yeah. if you don't know that, Stephen Furtick is an MDiv graduate from Southern Seminary. Uh, they're doing everything they can to make people forget that. <laughs> Herschel you said... You don't do Elevation or Bethel? Or I, yeah, rarely? I don't. Okay. Yeah. So right, yeah. The mu- we talked about how a lot of churches use the model of the worship music is to fill seats. This is it. This, the butts and seats are from music. That was their model. They latched onto that, and they did it really, really well. Like... They think of all of the time and, and, and resources that we put into things like our kids' ministry and uh, the preaching of the word. Like, we're, we're really investing in all the right spots. They invested strictly in the music, slick production, finding all the talent, hiring people to play on stage on Sunday morning who aren't believers. That happens a lot. You wouldn't believe how many churches do that. It's, yeah, it's mind boggling. <laughs> unbelievably common and not even just in the mega church world like there's churches in louisville doing this that we're not affiliated with but it happens um so yeah so the music is the core to their functioning right like they they sell the product of their music to bring people in and then um i don't even know if i've ever heard a sermon from bethel i'm i'm sure it's just kind of meh you know um, but on the flip side, what are some of your favorites? Some of my favorite pr- uh, Christian publishers? publishers? Yeah. So Sovereign Grace, obviously, is a huge one. Um, we're super thankful to give any money that we can to Sovereign Grace. City of Light. Um, I can't remember the name of the publishing arm, but Boswell and Papa make a lot of great... The and Gettys. Like right, right. So... Do, should we wholesale reject these? Here's where, like I said, if there is a worship war going on, it's going on over this. Um, because there is a lot of ideas in that we can redeem individual songs. And I have brothers that are leading worship in really faithful churches and whose central element of worship is the preaching of the word who are doing elevation in Bethel music. And I disagree with them in that. I don't hold it against them. I understand their viewpoint on it. Um, And, you know, they kind of see me as a little bit of a legalist in that. But then, on the other hand, I'm also doing a Hillsong song this morning. Uh, Hillsong has always been kind of like right right on the line for me. And, uh, you know, this documentary obviously is going to push that across the line for a lot of people. (laughs) so uh this is where the battle is happening is do we wholesale reject a christian music publisher and i don't want to bind anyone's conscience in that you know there's a lot of freedom in different people i can just tell you from from my perspective for what buck run does uh these two in particular we're just not going to do them um and I'm not so much worried about the money funneled to them uh, 
because if I, if I get worried about where every dollar goes to a secular place, then like, I wouldn't want to play the power company. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like we have unregenerate people turning our lights on. So like money goes to lost people all the time. It's just a fact of life. I'm more concerned about the shepherding aspect of it and not steering people towards harmful ministries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same thing happened to us, I I guess it would have been like 2009, 2010. You know, Elevation was like 80% of what I was leading in worship. I had no idea who Stephen Furtick was. Had never heard a single sermon. I just heard like these albums. The albums were incredible. And the lyrics were solid. You know, they met the other criteria. Um, But yeah, there is like scary stuff. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know a ton about vineyards, like day in, day out kind of theology and practices, but they were hugely instrumental musically. Yeah. And we wouldn't have modern worship music without vineyard. Had some outs recently. Right. And I will say too, the other thing that we have to be careful with is these are the big names. Um, I had a very similar experience at a Southern Baptist church, like giving, contributing part of a Southern Baptist church. So like even under our own umbrella, and that part of that is just the nature of our autonomy, it's going to leave room for that, is like this kind of stuff happens as well. Um, it was a sermon on, uh, it was a Christmas sermon on like a couple weeks before Christmas on Joseph deciding not to divorce Mary. And the application was, see how you guys can just like work out your family problems? <laughs> Sorry, what? Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, I lost my train of thought. It was something about, I was going to say something about what you said about the Devin and da, da, da. I don't know. No, I'm losing it. Yeah, taking it seriously. Well, yeah, thanks. I'm glad you think we take it seriously. I want us to. <laughs> um, Right, yeah. We're introducing our first Screamo worship song next week, so just be ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of baggage here. There's a lot of debate here. My encouragement is show grace. If you go to a church, if, if the Lord moves you from this area, I don't want, I'm not trying to encourage you to leave Buck Run, but if the Lord moves you from this area and you join a different church, and they go in, and the first thing they sing is a song from Elevation. Like, don't, don't like storm out and flip tables on your way out. Like, just have grace, because there's a really good chance that they're exactly like I was 10 years ago and just haven't, haven't done the homework. I am not enlightened. I am not wiser or smarter than those people. I just happen to have heard, and I, you know, by God's grace, this has been shown to me that this stuff is dangerous. Um, and, and not everyone's thinking about that. And so it doesn't make them a bad church. Um, so yeah. yeah. So here's a question. So when Isaac was consuming this stuff and when I was leading this stuff, when you were listening to it and and worshiping your car, was that authentic worship? Yeah. I think every time I led these songs in worship and I, we were textually driven, we were responding, we were submitting to God, we were esteeming God higher than ourselves, we were submitting to him, we were adoring him, we were confessing our sins, all of that, it's authentic worship happening through insufficient means. And it comes back to that idea that Christ redeems our worship, right? Like, I want us to always think of everything we do as refrigerator art. You know what I mean? My refrigerator is covered in just horrible scribbles that make no sense whatsoever, but they mean so much to me. I wouldn't change them out for anything. How much more God loves our feeble attempts to worship him. And there are real churches who love the Lord Jesus, and they want to proclaim the gospel, who are singing these songs, mostly because they're not thinking about it on the same level that we are. And that doesn't make us smarter than them. It just means that we heard about it, and now we have to do something. You know, now that we know, we're accountable for that knowledge. And most of the time, they just don't know. But even what we sing this morning, we could do it better. We could find better songs. We could preach a better sermon. No offense, Herschel. (laughs) But all of it, it, it's just refrigerator art. God loves it because it's from his children. And he 
values it because he values us and he loves us. He paid a dear, dear price for us. So, you know, we, we do the best that we can. Christ redeems it, makes it valuable. I'm going to add a fourth horseman here. See if you recognize him. Horatio Spafford. It is well. Wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Lost his mind, yeah. <laughs> Who knows the story of Horatio Spafford's wife and daughters on the ship, right? This is the story that we love to tell. So if you haven't heard it, here you go. Horatio Spafford is at home in America. He sends his wife and daughters to England. On the way there, there's a terrible storm. His two young daughters are killed. His wife writes back, devastated, telling him that this happened. My, our daughters were killed. I survived. I'm in England. I don't know what to do. He sits down and writes arguably the most beautiful hymn ever written. The lyrics in this stuff. Oh, my goodness. It is so good. Here, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pull some up here. Uh, we got to see this. Yeah. <laughs> this is my favorite, my favorite verse. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. You don't get better Christian songwriting than that. That's just, that's the pinnacle of Christian creativity. He went on to relocate to England with his wife, where through a series of trials and hardships, they figured out they could make a lot of money uh, by basically starting a cult. They started a cult. They operated out of Egypt. It was super wicked stuff. He died. She carried on the cult. It lasted for a long time. I don't remember what they were called. They had some super creepy name. They dressed weird, super bizarre. They made their riches not on writing the best hymn, but on uh, conning people through religious means. We don't tell that half of the story, right? We stop at like the tragedy and then writing it as well and then weeping with them. My point is, I think in a hundred years, we're going to tell better stories about elevation in Bethel. And we're going to tell stories about how God redeemed these things. And God used them despite our brokenness. There is that word again. <laughs> because this is a broken system, right? Everything to do with Christian publishing is broken. Because we're broken people. And we do things wrong. We do things the best that we can, but we mess up. And... I think right now in churches this morning, God is redeeming these things. Um, I feel accountable to the knowledge of what happens in these churches. I don't want to participate in their ministries. That's why I choose not to use them. Um, but God's going to redeem a lot of these songs, and he's going to tell a better story afterwards of how that was done. And the other thing is, <laughs> Horatio Spafford's cult is gone, right? So I don't have to worry about students Googling him and then like joining his cult in Egypt. So that threat, at least, is gone. So thank you, Don, for that 30-minute sidetrack. This is all your fault. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're out of time. Um, any final questions on this? Next week, we're going to look at, uh, we'll look at quality, uh, excellence, and creativity. Uh, what it means to pursue excellence as Christian worshipers, as uh, creators under the, you know, sub-creators under the chief creator, and uh, kind of show a couple different schools of thought on how we handle excellence 